if the human imagination is connected uh, to our, to the, the universal mind, which it is. So the way we the way we evoke a spirit, and I, when I say evocation, I mean bring a spirit up out of our collective unconscious through our subconscious. The way we do it is we use a dark reflective mirror. We put this mirror in the center of a triangle. And we use a triangle because this is a Kabbalistic device uh, whereby we have created a, a triangular plane. And that triangular plane um, contains the spirit in the mirror because, quite frankly, there's a, there's a um, there's a Pythagorean geometry at work here, and I might as well explain that, that the Hebrew Kabbalah uh, owes a lot to Pythagoras, <laughs> and it owes, it owes something to Hermes that owes a lot to Pythagoras, uh, and yet it's a biblical structure. We use that because the biblical structure helps us uh, uh, use those archetypes uh, from the Bible, which are are already implanted in our in our, on our in our subconscious and our collective unconscious. So the triangle is point one point, second point. That's a line. Third point forms a plane, and then that mirror becomes the fourth point, and that's the first solid, and it holds it right in right in the uh, the mirror. And we put that right outside the circle. So we got our face. We use our own face in the mirror. Now, we use our own face in the mirror, and as we stare at our at our reflection, with the sigil, of course, of the spirit, of the, of the signature of the spirit in grease pencil across, which tends to break up the structure and also uh, tends to this tends to personify the spirit itself because it is the spirit signature. And then you have your face in the mirror and you stare at it. And then there's an optical phenomenon where your face will black out, uh, go go dark, and then it will come back and then it will be something different. And it will be, it will be a, a distortion that is, that is, first time you experience this, it's, it's, it's quite an experience, I can tell you. And then you will be, if you are properly trained, you can actually let the spirit speak through your voice. And now you ask, you say, well, all right, well, this is my reflection. I can't be a spirit. Oh, yeah. But remember, you are the representative of God. You are in touch with the universal mind. You have everything. The whole universe is within your reach. So consequently, your reflection, and remember the biblical passage that God created man in his own image? Well, that's where it is, right there. So the spirit is an aspect that extends from your image, but on the other hand, uh, <laughs> that spirit is very, very much uh, a, an entity that, that exists in, in millions of other sub, uh, subconscious realms. And so it has a very much of a transpersonal reality of its own. And don't ever think it doesn't. Just because you can't photograph it and just because somebody else sees it differently, that doesn't mean that it, it, it doesn't have a universal existence, a very powerful universal existence. Now, with angels, angels are creatures of light, and they are creatures of light and balance, and they are positive, for the most part positive, uh, aspects and creative aspects of, of uh, what we call God, the, the love principle. I might want to mention at this point that, that uh, one of the founders, so the original inspirers and founders of Hermetic philosophy, Empedocles, divided the entire, the entire universe was divided into air, earth, fire, water, love, and strife. That's everything. The whole business, air, earth, fire, water, love, and strife. Well, now the angels are represent the love principle, and the spirits sometimes represent the strife principle. But there's no, there's no good and evil involved in this. I mean, love and strife, you can't have all love because.
because they had all loved everything but just coalesce and become one great big blob and wouldn't go anywhere. And if you have all strife, then we're all in continual misery. So consequently, uh, we have to have a balance between the two. Now, the angels represent the love principle, the spirits represent the strife principle, if you want to look at it that way. And so when we want to bring in the angels, we use a crystal. We use a crystal ball. Now, this isn't something we just developed in modern times. This was this the methods that I'm talking about here were used back in the Renaissance. They were used by by uh, most most of the magicians in the Renaissance that we know of actually used crystals and, and to a lesser extent dark mirrors. And what they would do is they would stare at the crystal and in a dim light with the candles focused around it. They stare at the crystal. And they would, uh, and they would uh, repeat the invocation over and over and over again. They keep repeating it, and then they would. There would be a glow that would appear around the crystal, an aura that would come over the uh, the ball, and then they would have the angel call down. His presence would be in that crystal, and at that point, they could be in contact with the angel. Now, whereas with the spirits in the mirror, you actually see their faces, and you know some some people uh, think that they appear in terrible form. Actually, uh, the grimoire we use uh, says over and over again, appear in fair and human form without horror or deformity and without delay. So the angel, but the angels in the crystal do not have to show you a face or even a body, because they're creatures of light. So you have this, this tremendous feeling of presence and this glow in the crystal, and you know that the angel is there, and the angel speaks through you and can take over your voice. As I will sit around the, the altar, and I'll say, uh, 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 Frater Johannes, invoke, and uh, he'll invoke, and then I'll go around and I'll say, I'll say, uh, I'll say Frater Buto invoke, and we'll keep going and going around, and then then when we get the angel, I will say, Frater Johannes, does the angel speak through you? And I, there's Johannes over there looking up at the crystal, and he says, yes, I'm, I am with you all, and you are all under my protection. And he'll, he'll channel. You know, this, you think this channeling process is so mysterious and only these new age gurus can do it. Well, we channel every week. <laughs> and, and, and some of it is, uh, some of it is very enlightening and, and, and even profound. Now, um, so the, this is the way that we do spirits and this is the way we do angels. But, you know, I, I want to uh, point out that the process here that we're using, the process that we're that we're we're using here is hypnotic, and for many many years, uh, different magical groups like uh, the Golden Dawn and the OTO would not permit their members to use hypnosis in any form. And, the, and yet magic, as you could probably tell from what I've been talking about, magic's a hypnotic process. It's a, an auto-hypnotic and a group hypnotic process, very definitely. It has to be. And yet the reason why these uh, old Victorian magical groups didn't, uh, didn't use the hypnotic process and kind of crippled themselves in this sense was because Hypnosis had a bad reputation. Now, these mesmerists were all the vogue in those days, and they they get out on stage and wave their hands to somebody and and put them into a trance and pick them up and get three men to walk on them, <laughs> form a bridge out of the poor person, and 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 get up there and sit on them and all kinds of stuff that they did, uh, and. And they were really amazing performers, but this gave hypnosis a very, very bad, bad reputation. We had a novel about a uh, called uh, Trilby, in which uh, the character Svengali, which has since become a household word, and Svengali controlled poor Trilby, 
uh, with his with his hypnotic power, and um, and so consequently, they were against hypnosis, and they even had their their members taking an oath against hypnosis. Well, that's a darn shame because hypnosis is the technique which makes visionary magic actually work. So what you should do if you're going to learn this, you have to learn self-hypnosis. You have to be able to hypnotize yourself. And you talk to yourself out loud. You talk to your subconscious. And this enables you, this gives you the, 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 uh, the loop that you, that you need to be able to actually vocalize the spirits. And, and then the other thing that you need to be able to do and that we teach is various disciplines of yoga. And one of the, you know, the yogas that you really, really need to work on is what we call Tratakam yoga. And this is the yoga of the fixed gaze. You, have to, you, you, you will train yourself to stare at a fixed point. Uh, you can use a little blue flower like the Tibetans do or, uh, or a, a, a little pearl on a, on a piece of black velvet or whatever a little point and you stare at this without uh, letting it entertain you with any kind of optical phenomenon or anything of that nature. You just stare at it and with a fixed point of concentration until you get to the point where your mind is empty, where your, well, I might better say your mind is calm, actually. I don't like this empty mind. That's an Eastern thing. We calm, completely calm your mind and stare at this at this one point. And then be and then teach yourself to become receptive, alert, but your mind is completely calm and this way you will learn to be able to 